how do you know you've earned the right to ask a person to buy? And I want everyone to write all the criteria down individually. Every person will have a different answer. They'll have a different list. One person will have, you know, uh, very few roles, one or two. Another person might have a hundred. And what I've always proven is the person with the most rules sells the least. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson. And we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got Jason Forrest with us today, and we're going to talk about the mindset of a sales warrior. Jason, welcome to Outside Sales Talk. Thanks for having me. Let's, let's get right to it. Awesome. So Jason is a leading authority in culture change programs and an expert in creating high performance, high profit, and quote unquote, best place to work type cultures. He's an award-winning author and he has won five international Stevie awards for his training programs. Today, we'll be discussing some of the topics from his most recent book, The Mindset of a Sales Warrior. So Jason, first, I mean, with respect to the topic, what is the mindset of a sales warrior? Yeah, great question. So basically, I, I believe that every sales warrior, there's kind of three components that every sales warrior must dial in, and that's their mindset, their process, and their language. Uh, so specifically on the mindset concept is that a sales, a sales professional is an athlete, and they should be coached like an athlete, not managed like an employee. But, you know, we, and we all have kind of a, a warrior spirit in us, you know, so any mother that's ever birthed a child is obviously a warrior. Any person that's ever been divorced and overcome that or uh, any any person who, who you know, made a bad grade on a test and overcame that. These are all warrior moments. We all have a warrior in us. But but what's interesting is you think you take people like a first responder or a frontline healthcare worker or the military, they 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 have to be a warrior all the time. And I believe that that uh, a salesperson is the same way, that your top salespeople truly have to be a warrior all the time because they're fighting the war on all fronts. And I talk about this in my book that, you know, they've got they've got the customer talking about how, you know, the operations department is not fulfilling their orders fast enough. They got prospects that say they're overpriced. They got their boss telling them that they're not making their quota. And if they don't, they're fired or, or if they if they are selling more than they're supposed to, then they, they have too easy of a territory. You know, they've got uh, they've got internal people that think they're overpaid. They've got friends and family that say, why, why don't I ever get to see you? So they're fighting the war on all fronts. And so the idea behind uh, having a warrior mindset is to how do you how do you create your own kind of locus of control? How do you create your own uh, level of mental toughness? Because you might be the only person that's on your side in some in some situations. Absolutely. And, and how how do you do that? How do you. How do you uh, kind of keep focused on 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 what you need to do to to have that warrior focus? And how do you how do you build that in yourself? What would you say? What types of techniques could you use to to thicken the skin and make yourself uh, able to be always on like that? Um, yeah. So so as it relates to the book, the mindset of a sales warrior, and I talked about there's 42 different strategies on how to. Um, remove the leashes that are holding you back. And that's probably a, a good time to introduce this formula. So the formula is performance equals knowledge minus leashes. So performance is what we do. Knowledge is what we've been taught to do. But a leash is any sort of mental resistance that holds us back from doing what we've been taught to do. So for example, um, right? So performance is what we do. Knowledge we've been taught to do. And a leash is any resistance that holds us back. Are so, those leashes look, internal or are they external to us? The leashes are 100% internal. And so there, there's actually four types of leashes. So self-image, how I see myself. Do I have an identity of a salesperson or a sales warrior? Do I have an identity of this? Uh, do I have an identity as being an advocate? Do I have an identity as being a protector? So what's my self-image? Do I have confidence, self-esteem, self-efficacy? Uh, another one is, is story. These are the kind of excuses that we hear a lot of times um, I call them leashes, but other people call them excuses. But the leash would be a, a story, something like, um, "Well, the reason why people aren't buying right now is because it's COVID, and and uh, you know, as soon as I can get back to being in person with them and selling face to face, that I can sell." 
The reason why I'm not selling is because I can't sell over Zoom. That's a story. That's external. It's a leash. Okay. So the third, the third type of leash is a um, reluctance or a fear. And, and there's a research company called BSRP that, that measures 16 different types of sales call reluctances. So reluctances like over repair, reluctances like arranging payment, asking for the order, referral aversion, uh, telephobia, using, or there's actually a reluctance on using social media that, you know, here's an example of that. I had a, a salesperson one time that said, um, which I think is so comical to me. He said, he said, Jason, I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to connect with everyone on LinkedIn. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because, you know, I want to be careful with how many connections that I have, and I don't want to overuse my connection allowance. And I said, well, LinkedIn allows you up to 10,000 connections. And I said, I said, I said, let's look at how many you have. And I said, you, you've got 450 connections. <laughs> And so you're a long way from 10,000. Now I myself, um, um, you know, I, I myself had, had, maybe it's even more than 10,000. It's quite a bit, right? There's a like, lot. I think they, it's in the 30,000s. 30,000. That's what it is. Yeah. Cause I, cause I was just thinking about my own and I've got 15,000 connections. There you go. So that's what, that's what threw, threw me off. And so I said, look, I've got 10 or 15,000 connections right now and I'm not concerned about it. And I said, so once I get maxed out, then, then I can have some VA that goes through there and, and based on a criteria starts like unfriending or unconnecting to the low level ones to build so I can have space for, and I can top grade my connections, right? But and I know that sounds crazy, but in his mind, he was relentless when it came to networking in person. He was relentless when it came to cold calling, but he had, a, he had this weird reluctance that the rules of social media were different. It was just a weird thing, right? That's a reluctance. There's, the last one is called a rule. And a rule is anything I need to see, feel, or hear to give myself permission to engage. And so think of like rules from the military. Don't fire until fired upon, right? Well, that, that's actually a very strong rule when it comes to selling. Is people say, well, you must earn the right to ask a person to buy. Okay, well, how do you know you've earned the right? And if I ask that question, uh, I've asked that question, how do you know you've earned the right to ask a person to buy? And I want everyone to write all the criteria down individually. Every person will have a different answer. They'll have a different list. One person will have, you know, uh, very few roles, one or two. Another person might have a hundred. And what I've always proven is the person with the most rules sells the least. Absolutely. Yeah. This right. Is a great framework. I really like this. So that's the whole book. The whole book is around this, this performance formula, performance equals knowledge minus leashes. And it's just a simple concept that, look, I wish that based on the educational world we're in, I wish that we can learn something and immediately go do it. But we just know that's not how the human condition works. Humans have free will. They've got emotions. They've got beliefs. They've got all the stuff that gets in the way. I call them leashes. And so what, what we need to be working on is how do we remove those specific leashes that hold us back from executing? Well, and, and you, you run this, you know, very top end, like very well, well-known um, sales training company. Tell me how, how can sales training, what can you do with sales training to, to remove these leashes? What, what, what's the strategy there? How does that, how do you do that? It's great. I mean, that, that, that right there is the, 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 our secret sauce. I mean, and I'll have no problem telling it because we need to make it happen. Uh, so I wrote, I wrote a book a few years ago called WTF, which stands for Why Training Fails. And, and uh, in, in the book says 164 billion is spent every year on training, 70% fails to ever do anything, to achieve any sort of ROI. And I, and I said, this book explains why. Because when I started my company 11 years ago, that was the, that was the crusade that I was on. Was I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sick and tired of all of these trainers calling themselves trainers but if you look at the definition of training, it's to change behavior. And then you go, hey, show me the wake of the behavioral change that you've created and they've got nothing to show for it. So I wanted yeah. to be, I wanted to disrupt that. And so, so that was my focus of how do you actually change behavior? And the answer is, one of the answers is, is remove the leash that holds them back. So that, that leads me to the question you just asked. The question was, well, how does training do that? Well, it, it, in some cases, I'll tell you the simplest technique that a trader can start doing is be bold enough on a, on a, on an account, I call them accountability calls. So in our company, we've got, 
Every, anytime you hire us, our minimum engagement is 90 days. That's a minimum we'll work with you because we don't believe in the, 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 the one day event. We think your performance is more important than a one night stand. And so we're not going to just do a one night stand event for you. We're going to do an, on, a, a, an ongoing 90 day program, right? But in that ongoing program on those Zoom dojo sessions, my trained instructors ask one simple question every single time, if not other questions. But that question is, hey, what stops you from doing blank with 100% of your customers this week? So you, you learned blank in the video. What stops you from that? And then they'll say it's gonna be the reluctance, the rules they've created. They don't have the confidence. Uh, they don't, yep. They've got a story as to why they can't do it. Not enough time, whatever it is, whatever the story is. Um, I, I, really like this framework. I think most people, I, I, I like the, the little equation, I guess, first I like equations in general, but like performance equals knowledge minus leashes. And I think most training tends to focus on the knowledge um, variable, not the, not the subtracting the leashes variable, which is really interesting. Right, but that's because, not training, that's education. Yeah, yeah. Training, and that's the difference, right? So yeah, that makes a ton of yeah, sense. So, yeah, so you take any of these concepts, right? You take any of these, con you've had some great people on here. I mean, I love Chris Voss and all of the work that he's doing, you know, Victor, Mark Hunter. I mean, these are all great. These are all great educators and great speakers and great authors and great content. But that's really the, the, the technique is if you go back and listen, any, anyone who's listening right now, go back and listen to these podcasts. And say, you know what? My favorite podcast episode was blank. Let's say it was from Chris Voss. He had some really great stuff that he teaches and on negotiation skills. And so let's say, you know, I really like his whole idea of, of uh, labeling. You know, he's a big, I'm, I'm, I'm an NLP background. Um, and so I, all the stuff that he teaches, a lot of NLP stuff. And so I really like the idea of, of labeling the emotion and getting the customer to be very specific around that. Okay. Then my question to you would be, so what stops you from doing that with every single prospect that you talk to? And then you go, well, I mean, I do it most of the time. Okay. Well, give me an example this week of a time you didn't do it. Well, I didn't do it when I was talking to a CEO. What stopped you from talking to a CEO? Well, Jason, CEOs, listen to this. CEOs are just different. And leash. As soon as you immediately try to justify, Jason, it's just different over the phone. Jason, it's just different when you sell on LinkedIn. Jason, it's just different when you're in the boardroom. And leash. Immediately, it's a leash. Well, Because my concept is great, great. either Jason, the concept just, works just, or it doesn't work. You go just ahead. cost everyone like two weeks of time. They got to go back and listen to every episode now. There's like 120 of them. And now they got to look through them with this lens. I mean, ah. <laughs> Okay. What but that's, I mean, you know, but seriously, but my point is, I mean, think about how successful people would be if, if, if they actually slow down a second and stop over consuming with everything out there. I mean, look, you got a, you got a, you got a, you got a lot of people on this, on the show, which is phenomenal. These are all, I mean, everyone on here has got some genius concept that can dramatically give a person a probably a 10, 20, 30% pay raise, but all they got to do is just take one podcast and just ask themselves that one question Everything I learned in this podcast from Victor, from Deb, from so-and-so, what stops me from doing everything they said 100% of the time? And once you do everything they tell you to do, then, then go, okay, now, I, now I've earned the right to go listen to a different person. And I bet- But there's no point of being a master of, 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 of nothing. I would guess the leashes that people identify with one thing that they've learned and not applied are going to be highly correlated with other things they've learned and not applied. So I, I bet certain people, uh, I bet everyone just has, everyone has these leashes, I'm sh and I'm, I bet that they keep playing themselves out over and over and over again. Um, of course, I mean, we, 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 all we all have leashes. I mean, I, I have leashes myself. And people go, well, well, Jason, do you ever get rid of leashes? And my simple answer is uh, only when, you, when you've decided to accept whatever level of performance you're currently at. So if you're if you if you're currently earning, I mean, I know a salesperson I'm training right now that's making seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Does she have a leash? Yes, because is it possible for her to make eight? Yes. Is she currently the highest performing salesperson in her marketplace? Yes. You see, but but I guarantee you right now she's got a leash because she could sell more. 
You know, what percentage of salespeople are on a, are on a plateau at any given moment? The answer, 100%. 100%. What would you say? I, I completely agree. What, what, what would you say the, the, some of the most common leashes that you see come up over and over again? And, and what's the question that you could ask uh, a sales rep that would un unearth this leash and, and get them to challenge it in their own mind? Perfect. So again, I highly recommend, right? Everyone go to Amazon or Audible and, and buy my book, Mindset of a Sales Warrior. I, it's my entire life's work is in this book on coaching sales people to, from, to remove these this anxiety in them, this this fear in them. And and on Audible, it's even better in my opinion, because I'll, I'll read the book to you in my soothing voice. And then my wife and I discuss it in podcast style after every strategy. So it's a it's even deeper than the actual physical book, in my opinion. So it's better. Uh, but but here's here's the number one. The number one leash is is um, is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of reluctance, and the type of reluctance is called yielder, yielder. Okay, so think of like a yield sign, and the yielder reluctance is is that I yield the control over to the customer I'm talking to. I yield the control over to the prospect. Okay, now here's here's the simple reframe that I would, if, I, if you had yielding tendencies, here's the reframe that I would do for you, the simple technique to help you see this differently. There's a lot of techniques, but this will be a simple one. And I would just say something like, okay, well, behind every behavior is a positive intention. And so what's, so I'm curious by letting the customer control the conversation, letting them, you know, letting them um, guide where they want to go. What's your intention? What are you, what's, what's your ultimate goal with that? And, and the, in, in the person might say that's got yielding tendencies, they might say, well, the customer knows what they really want. Um, they're very kind of dogmatic about it. And so, you know, I don't want to interrupt them. And, you know, my, and I said, well, how do you want to be seen by them? And the person says, well, I want to be, I want to be seen as a helper. I want to be seen as someone that's truly helpful to them. And then I would say, got it. So is it possible that, <clears throat> that your highest intention of being helpful is actually coming across as this genuine, unprofessional, and not helpful. And you might, you might say, well, I don't know, how is that possible? Well, I mean, if, if, if you dogmatically, you know, we're dealing with some sort of like virus like COVID or something, and you went into a doctor's office or a good loved one had COVID and you were dogmatically trying to control the conversation with a doctor of all the things that you wanted done. And the doctor just sat back and said, well, it's your life. It's your, it's your body. You must know what, what you want. And the doctor just decided to just do whatever you told them to do and didn't speak up and didn't be a doctor. And then later on, you found out that the doctor, the doctor could have given, you know, drugs that would have made the experience a lot, a lot easier and not so detrimental and not so, you know, hurtful. What would you have done? And then you would have said, well, gosh, I probably would have sued the doctor for malpractice. It's exactly right. So, Right now, is it possible because you're you, you're the expert and you know exactly what the customer needs, but by letting them control the process, you're actually coming across as someone that's a doctor having mill practice. A salesperson committing malpractice. I like that. And and there is a, a big difference between a helper and someone who is leading the customer and consulting the customer in the, a direction that they're going to be better off and is going to create value in them. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Yeah. So I have in my book, I talk about the levels of a warrior. The bottom level is someone who's afraid to come across as more of a follower. The next level is a helper. I think about 70 to 80% of salespeople are in this category. The next level is a leader and the final level is a warrior. And a warrior really is, you know, your top kind of 5%, top 1%. The easiest way to understand what a warrior is, is think of the founder of the company. That's the warrior. Because, you know, it's, you think of a small business, you got the warrior, you know, your company, the warrior, right? My company, the warrior. It's like, so for example, it's a warrior is a protector. They believe so much and, and they're an advocate for what their product provides, the problem they're trying to solve, the dent in the universe they're trying to create. And they come across with like that level of conviction that when a customer says something like, well, I know, you know, look, I mean, here's the deal, you know, like, for example, let's say someone came to me and said, you know, um, you know, look, all, all the training is exactly the same out there. And I know you're charging, you're charging me 30% more, but I mean, I'm not going to go forward with you unless you charge me the same as, as ABC competitor of yours. You know, it's just, it's not worth, it. it's all the same. Okay. As the founder, 
I'm taking my gloves off and that's fighting words. Because I don't do something that's the same as my competition and then charge more for it. That's malpractice. That's unethical, right? I'm charging more because I'm providing a better solution for you, a better outcome, a better goal. I'm doing something that's better than my competition and I believe in that. And so I'm gonna protect you from you spending less and getting less. I'm gonna protect you from yourself. That's a warrior. See the difference? Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and yeah. I think it is, it's, it's sometimes, it's, it's why with smaller companies and growing companies, the, the, the founder has to be involved in a lot, of this, a lot of the key customer acquisitions and early deals because uh, it's really hard to, for anyone else to speak with the level of authority that they can. Unless they hire us. <laughs> because we've got, because that's literally what we work on. That's one of the main things we work on is with those small businesses is we work on, we call it, I call it the founder's dilemma. And we work on how do we make sure that the company, you know, the company can scale and they can take that same passion and conviction and the salespeople can speak with that. So we have a course called, uh, called uh, Advocacy Unleashed. And Advocacy Unleashed is, is you know, your best advocate is your, is your owner. And, and so we teach them you know, through a, through a series of lessons, how to become an advocate for your product, an advocate for your customer, an, an ad, customer's mission, advocate customer's mission, an advocate for yourself, an advocate for your company, et cetera. And it's very cool because in that journey, we bring the owner in and we, and we ask candid questions of them to truly get to the heart and the soul and the root, you know, of, of, of their journey and why they created this so that we can, we can translate that and, and make sure that the salespeople are speaking with that same why. A lot of salespeople just don't know that stuff. They don't know the journey and the story and the problem the entrepreneur was trying to solve. Oh, absolutely. Especially uh, in, in fast growing companies, right? You, you, a lot of companies move from employee number 100 to employee number 500 pretty fast. The founder hasn't met all those people and certainly hasn't gotten the chance to sit down and have a, have a three beers and tell the whole story, right? <laughs> you got to create that sustainableness, you know? So, so that, but that goes back though, right? That's still just the knowledge. So this is where it's a tough thing, right? Because number one, I can teach them the language of an advocacy, sorry, the language of an advocate. I can teach them the language of an owner, but remember performance doesn't just equal knowledge. Performance equals knowledge minus leashes. So first you have to give them the knowledge of here's what an advocate sounds like, and here's how, they, how, to, how to have the beliefs of an advocate and why you should be an advocate. But then we have to we have to remove the leashes of well what stops you from from speaking with this level of authority and boldness to your prospects? Well, okay. well, I mean, Jason, I feel like I feel like I'm going to turn confident. I'm going to turn them off. <laughs> yeah, come in, right? is arrogant. Yeah, like I, oh, I haven't earned the right to speak that way. The you know fear. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll do, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it on the second call. The first call is all about getting to know each other and building rapport. I'll, I'll be like that on the second call. Well, turns out buddy, 90% of the 90% of that situation never gets to a second call. <laughs> so, right. right. <laughs> so you're really missing out on a lot of opportunity by waiting for that second call to turn it on. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I've, I've heard you talk before about your five, four, three sales process. Can you, can you tell me about that sales process, what it includes and, and how it helps salespeople close deals? Sure. Yeah. So the, you know, so, so the five, four, three, that's what actually has listed us. Listen, me as number five in the world and global gurus right now. And the warrior selling program is listed as number two in the world. And our management program is listed number one, but it's because of that process. So so it's five steps to understand the customer's mission, four steps to present solutions, three steps to resolve the sale. The, the, the biggest thing people will tell me about the process when they go through it, if they've gone through other things like Challenger and whatever, is they'll say, uh, there's a lot of elements that are very similar. So like the Challenger model is very similar to um, our sixth step in the process. The difference is Challenger only teaches one concept they don't teach you like, where do you put it in and how do you actually say it? And, and when do you say, I mean, just, it's a, they don't, they miss a lot of the pieces. Right. And so, so again, it's the sixth step of our 12 step process, right. Is, is like being, is, I call it, uh, the, I call it the veto step. So veto is, is you want to veto the customer's paradigm, veto the customer's perspective of how they currently see your product or service or buying from you or buying in your industry, whatever it is, because you want to carve a unique niche in their brain. Because if, if you don't veto their current paradigm of what they expect, 
And then how in the world are you going to charge more for, for what you're offering? So you have to, dis- in the in NLP world, we call it disrupt the pattern, right? So you have to disrupt the pattern. And so VITO is very important. So VITO stands for vision, example, teach, own. And so the vision always needs to be something very different. So whenever, whenever my team coaches companies on creating that veto message, it's one of the hardest steps of the process because, you know, they go, well, what's your, what's, you know, what's, what makes you so unique and different? Oh, we've got, I mean, Jason, we just, we're all about quality. Okay. Well, so is Walmart. What else do you got? Is it, does it, any of your competitors say that you're best in quality too? Yeah, they probably say they're best in quality. Okay. So you can't say that anymore. What else you got? Well, I mean, our people are second to none. Okay. Does any of your competitors say their people are second to none? Yeah, probably. So you can't say that either. What about, well, our customer service is, is impeccable. Again, can anyone say that? Yeah. Okay. So right now, you, the reason why you're not charging, you can't get away with charging 20% more is because you're saying the same thing everyone else is saying, and then you're trying to charge more for it. Does it work? So tell me what causes you to be 20% more than anyone else. Why did, why did people leave, leave your competitor and come buy from you? What have you heard from your consumers that said, I was sick and tired of blank that XYZ supplier does. And so because of that, I decided to do business with you. Give me that. And whatever that is, then we will create something, right? So like my veto, for example, uh, I have two, I mean, we have several vetoes, right? Depends on what we're selling. But like for, I have a, I have a, I have a recruiting company and I have a training company. So on my recruiting company, my veto is real simple. And that is, you know, I, I, I wanted to disrupt, uh, my, the vision of FPG recruiting is disrupt the sales recruiting industry by combining a recruiting company, an assessment company, a training company into one. Because I was sick and tired of trying to find a third party sales recruiting firm to recommend to my clients. They either, one, weren't focused on sales, Two, didn't have the NLP questions to back it up. So they really didn't know who they were actually hiring. Number three, they wouldn't use third-party assessments because that it slowed their process down. I feel like that's a lack of integrity. And of course, number four, they didn't have an onboarding process. So I decided to disrupt the whole thing. And so we we right now are a done-for-you recruiting system. We'll go out there and find you a fearless sales warrior, make sure they're better than half your team using third-party assessments, and onboard them for you in a 90-day program. If they don't perform, replace them for you for free. But you see how you see how it's polarizing. You see how it's disrupting. It's 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 you know same thing with our training veto. You know so so eleven years ago I was sick and tired of of uh, of not a single sales trainer out there that could actually change behavior. And I was working in corporate America and I couldn't find a vendor that I could bring in for my own organization. And so I said, forget it. I got to I got to solve my own problem. I got to go I got to go create it. And so that's where that's where. That's where FPG sales training began. 164 billion is spent on training. Uh, 70% fails to achieve an ROI. I want to be the first sales training company that could prove to be in the 30% because companies deserve to have fearless sales warriors and we can provide that for them. So you see how it's disruptive? Well, especially if you're unlocking the potential of so many people. Because I, I really feel like you're approaching training from a slightly different angle than than most people that I hear from in, in that you're focusing on what's holding them back as opposed to what they don't know. Like people always love a, a sales trick or a tip, like a, a magical key that's going to unlock things for them. But I, I, I have to say, I agree with you that it, more often than not, it's, it's something that's holding them back in their actual behaviors that that really is holding them back from t- getting to the next level. And so if you're able to both combine the recruiting and the training, I think that's a really cool idea because if you're actually unlocking someone's potential at the same time you're putting them in a new role, that's powerful. Yeah, well, in our thank you for that. In our case, that, that's where the recruiting side is such a great thing is that is that we have some proprietary uh, systems that I've created to find the most unleashed, every salesperson's leashed, but to find the most unleashed salesperson we can find for that company. And we've been able to do that time and time again. So for example, here's a cool stat for you. Do you know that, um, that, that, that the research says that 80% of salespeople in their first year do not meet the desired expectations of their, of their company? That makes sense. Yeah. 80%. Isn't that That's insane? a crazy stat, but it makes sense. I mean, it does. Crazy stat. 
So we have a 90 day guarantee. And right now we're only replacing 20% of them. So we've been able to flip the script, flip the oh. script. And I think, and I think it's because one, you, you, we hired the, that the most unleashed person possible. I, I have a simple acronym that I say we hire Gumps. So my last name is Forrest. So Forrest Gumps, right? <laughs> so Gumps, goal oriented. They're super clear on their prospecting targets and goals and what they're trying to accomplish. Unleashed of their of their self image stories, reluctances, and rules. M motivated to prospect even when they get ghosted. We all get ghosted. I pick up the phone and keep going. And P stands for procedural based, which is an NLP meta pattern that means willing and able to continually follow a process versus kind of fly by my seat of the pants. Every customer is different. It's not predictable. So one, you got to hire gums and then you got to, and then you got to, you got to give them the, the, you know, in our case, the second best onboarding program in the world. And the combination of those things is what allows us to, 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 to flip the script and, and, and only replace 20%. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, um, it, it, it jumps out at me as being really powerful. It really does. I, and I, I think it's because people, other, most people aren't using this as the criteria of the, they're not, they're not using this, the types of criteria you're using. And so if you've identified, here's things that really drive success and no one's screening for them, they're screening for, you know, do they know how to prospect? Do they know how to uh, qualify? Do they know how to close? Sell me this pen. If if they even have a good process, which I think probably more than half of companies don't have a great process for hiring salespeople, which is a whole other issue. But if they even have a process, you're basically arguing you're screening for the wrong things. You should be looking for you know a lack of leashes, which is you know the things that are going to hold them back from being successful. But instead, you're looking for you know can they sell me this pen? These other things that. Or if you ask, you know, any sales manager, what do you what do you look for in a hire? Um, they would the things that they would tell you. But you're if you're screening for these different things, you're going to identify uh, a different batch of people who are the who are the, who will eventually get hired if if the process is geared around that. And then uh, and if those truly are the things that drive success, then it's it makes sense that this is flipping the script. Yep. And then the other thing we do, thank you. The other thing we do is is we're constantly you know, analyzing the success of that. So, so what I just told my recruiting team to do is I said, hey, let's, let's, go, let's make a list right now you know, out of, let's take, let's take the top 10% of all recruits that we've, we've placed for salespeople in all the different industries, all different companies in the last 12 months, right? Based on the highest performing, the one that we get the best feedback on that, you know, et cetera, right? Now let's look at them. And let's go back to their interview questions. Let's go back to how they answered the questions. Let's go back to their assessment results. And let's see specifically if we can, if we can, if we can reverse engineer what makes them even special. Well, yeah, so, what, what are the types of questions that you would recommend asking if you're a, sale, a hiring sales manager to determine if someone is unleashed? Uh, great question. So um, again, that's part of our secret sauce, part of our recruiting package, right? But but I'll give you I'll give you one question, and that is to, to, to determine if they're procedural based versus option based. So so this is a very important one. So option based salespeople are you know if you were to ask them a question like, hey, so tell me about tell me about your sales process and how does it work, and and the, if they if they immediately respond back, well, you know, it kind of depends on the situation. One, I know they probably have a leash and or their meta pattern is that they are not procedural based, is that their meta pattern, their brain, it's just the way their brain's wired, is they're more option based. And option based people aren't bad, it's just not a good fit for sales. So option based people are actually better as entrepreneurs uh, because entrepreneurs are very like fly by the seat of their pants, they're all about creating things, uh, but they're not gonna, I mean, most entrepreneurs don't follow their own processes they create, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so, so that well, so that that's the question I would ask. Sales roles that I, I could imagine that option based sales reps would be the people that you were screening for. Like if it's a brand new product and you're trying to feel out who 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 what the process is and who's going to be buying this product and you're you're really early stage and you're kind of feeling things out. But at a more once you've kind of you know put the rails under the train and you know the direction you're going, you know how to get there. Here's here's the best practices. You, you more want, you, you don't want artists anymore. You want soldiers who are going to, warriors, I guess would be your word, that are going to execute um, execute the process. So I, 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 that makes a ton of sense to me. 
Yeah, I mean, just think about the you know the obviousness of it. Of of if the philosophy is every customer is different, well, that that creates a lot of um, of unpredictability, you know, in 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 their performance, which means I can't forecast that as a business owner. But but I want to instead create a predictable process that leads to predictable performance and predictable success. That's what I want to do. Why not? You know, in any other in any other department. We've got predictable processes that lead to predictable success, accounting, finance, getting the books closed by the fourth of the month, you know, I mean, whatever it is, right? Building operational systems. These are all predict how we answer the phone. It's all predictable. And so, and that's how you scale a company. But for some reason, we've just, we've always kind of said, well, sales is kind of different. And so they kind of, they're kind of mavericks. They kind of do their own thing, but the entire company is dependent upon their performance. Right. And so it's not necessary. So the most successful sales warriors are actually very predictable. And, and what I mean by that is, is if, if, if you look at the most successful salespeople, most successful, real, let's, say, let's take a realtor, for example. A realtor is always a funny thing. Because think about how many realtors are option-based. Because think about the number one reason why someone becomes a realtor is they say, well, I want to be a realtor, Jason, because I get flexible, I get flexible hours built upon my built around my personal lifestyle, and I could have flex, I could have unlimited income potential. Now, do you know of a single salesperson on the planet that has flexible hours built around their lifestyle that has that makes unlimited income potential? No. No, not one. The hardest working make the most money. I found that pattern it, it, throughout life and everything. <laughs> yeah. It tends to be the person who wakes up every morning and you know, starts calling at five o'clock in the morning, you know, has a ritual. They have a step-by-step -step ritual. And so I tell people all the time, I go, look, you know, if you study the top producers in any area, they're pretty boring to watch. They're pretty boring to shadow because they do, honestly do the same thing every single day in the same order. And when they talk to a customer, it's the same series of questions that lead to the same outcome. And if, and if, if they feel like it's not working for them, well, they'll try something different, but they'll make little tweaks, little corrections, little adjustments, and then they'll, and then they'll, and they'll keep, keep doing it. You know, that's what they do. It's what a comedian does. A comedian doesn't just come out there and start winging it. A comedian like Chris Rock or something, you know, he's got a set list. What does he do? He tries out a new, a new story, a new joke. He'll put it inside of the proven set list. Then yeah, he tests the merchandise. It's actually amazing learning. I, I learned about how that worked a few years ago, and it's, it was just amazing. They, you know, it's always the same. They give the same set of jokes for you know four hundred times, but they they're, they're, they tweak it a little bit every once in a while. But often it's just you know every and in every intonation is all planned. It's all you know every every pause. It's all it's all acting. It's but why would you? But why would you not do that if? If, if you know that if I deliver this set list over an hour and a half or, a, you know, a musician, whatever it is, you know, imagine dragons. If I deliver this set list exactly like this, then I make $10 million. Right. Well, why would I not just want to do that over and over again and no make $10 million each time, you know? Once you figured out what to do, you run the playbook. It makes total just sense. Just do it. Well, Let's it, do it, it, you know. Related to uh, you, know, you, you talk about in your book, the model of the, the mastery pyramid. Uh, it, is this related to that? Well, somewhat. I mean, because that, that's actually more of a preframe because you can, it's really hard to have a desire to be, you know, ritualistic and procedural if, if we're depending, depending upon where you are on the mastery pyramid, right? So the bottom level of the mastery pyramid is plain to not lose. That's just the person who says, you know what, what's the minimum I need to do to not get fired? And then you've got plain to cruise, which is right above that. And that's, that's your salespeople. Those are your, these are always funny. These are your salespeople that they, they kind of, they culturally know what the number is, the quota in the organization, the production number, that they need to stay within that radar. So they're not on the crap list, but they're not on the nice list. You know what I mean? Like they're not winning any awards, but they're not getting called out for anything. So it's a plane to cruise. Every industry has it. Home building, it's two sales a month. In mortgages, it's a million dollars a month. In cars, it's, it's, um, it's eight cars a month. I'm telling you, every industry I've ever worked in, you know, business to business, outside sale, it's always some number you know like ours for example our company for example the plan to cruise number is is 60,000 uh, 60, in new in new revenue a month so basically so they can sell training or whatever uh, but my point is that that's the plan to cruise number that because well, why is that the number well because in our company if they do anything less than that then then they're really not profitable for us they're too expensive for us if they're not bringing in at least that every month right so that's kind of that sweet spot you know so what's above that? Uh, the number above that is um, uh, above the mastery pyramid is 
plane four, I almost, almost forgot it, plane four improvement. And so plane four improvement is, okay, how, do I, how can I be better than I was yesterday? And then the next level above that is playing for the challenge. And that is, how can I, how can I beat my personal best? Which is a whole different game, you know? And then, the, and then the final level is playing for mastery. And that's really like the Peyton Manning, you know, uh, Tom Brady level, which is, they're just, you know, it's, it's, it's like, they're just constantly making little adjustments, little tweaks, you know, they're trying new things, but it's just this whole different like Yoda Jedi world that they're in that you just kind of need to let them have their own little world, you know, but they're very, very rare people that play in a master. I mean, if, if everyone just decided to be at playing for improvement, we would, we would all sell more. Right. Right. You know? Um, well, and that makes a ton of sense. Um, well, like the, the next, uh, the next section of the podcast today is sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions and quick answers. I'm ready. I'm ready. What's a common mistake you see sales reps make in their conversations with prospects? Uh, sure. I, I would say, I would say not bring up the competition. They don't ask the question, Hey, so I, I know you're, I know you're unhappy with your current supplier, your current, this, your current, that, uh, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish is blank. So I'm curious before you met us, who has been your favorite so far? What caused them to be your favorite? And, and what do they not have that, that caused you to still look, you know, look, look or, talk, or have a conversation with us? And then they say, you know, well, I really like them because of this, but they don't have blank. And so that, that's also why I'm, I'm talking to you. Okay, well, suppose I can, I can give you everything that, they, that you liked about them plus blank. Then is that really what you're looking for in a, in a supplier, in a manufacturer, in a IT provider, whatever you're selling, right? So it's, you gotta talk, you gotta bring up the competition that gives you an, an advantage. Absolutely. And the knowledge you can gain there of having a frank conversation is just crucial. Well, a corollary to that question. What, what is the number one key to differentiating yourself from your competitors? I, I would say going back, be, be very clear on that veto, right? So being very, being, be, being what I call provocatively respectful. So you've got to be very clear. And you got to you got to know your competition better than the competition knows themselves, because see, selling is a game of, of of chess, not checkers. And so there's there's no reason why a person should ever be stumped on an objection. There's only like a handful of objections a person's ever going to give, right? Price, terms, product, whatever it is, right? And so, but once the person brings up the objection, you should by that by that time you should have already done a strong enough discovery three hundred and sixty to figure out you know, what their pain points are, what they're trying to accomplish, what's working, what's not working. You should already gotten rapport with them on that. You should already disrupted the pattern with your veto. You should already ask them questions to compare what you're offering to what everyone else is offering. So when they bring up the objection later on, you're just reminding them of all the things they said they couldn't stand about the competitor X and the things that they like about you. And then you're just anchoring it to, and that's the reason why we're you know, 20 to 20% more than them. Makes sense. and and. What, what would you say, in your opinion, is the most challenging part of a career in sales? Uh, okay. First thing that comes to mind is, is just not having, a, not having an outcome frame of I'm constantly going to be better than I was yesterday, I think is the most challenging thing. I think that I think what happens a lot of times with salespeople is that is that depending upon when they enter into the market, I mean, look, the best, the worst time to get a sales job the worst time to get a sales job is is when you choose an industry that is hot and heavy and 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 I call it a bunch of market sales right where where everyone's wanting that whatever it is you know like for example let's say someone got into like selling ppp product or pp uh personal protection you know equipment you know a, a year ago right you know oh i'm a great salesperson i'm selling $200,000 in 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 hand sanitizer i'm phenomenal what do you think? What do you think happening to them right now? <laughs> right? If they if they believed that they're that good based upon selling that in that circumstance, then they're going to be completely, you know, uh, in a nightmare right now because no one needs that stuff right now, right? As much, you know. Right, right. So, so I think it's just I think it's just not listening to your own press and it's not judging or 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 or, or judging your success based upon your pocketbook. It's judging your success based upon. Honestly, your previous personal best. So if you can, if you can, you know, if you can convert a customer, you know, and, and, and it takes you sixty minutes over two conversations, 
then, then, then how do you do it in 55 minutes over two conversations next time? So take that attitude of how do you always one up yourself? Be a warrior. Well, and, and you, you've uh, built a career around helping people be their best. What would you say the best business advice is that you've ever received? D don't, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, that's kind of, kind of dumb advice there. I mean, it's, it's cliche advice, but I would say, I mean, the best thing that, that, you know, I learned from my dad and from different people is, you know, they would say, look, find the most successful person in the area that you want to be, you want to be in and, and ride their experience coattails, you know, co copy what they do. And then once you can, once you can be them, then, then you have permission to go, to go find something else that you suck at and go copy them, you know, and that's, you know, I just, I think, I think so many people have too much of a, of an ego on things and they have this belief system that says, well, Jason, I mean, that's not really me. It's not really authentic. You know, I got to be me. Okay. We'll be the poor version of you then. But it's, it's, I'm saying, and what I mean, I mean that with all respect. I mean, because look at my kids, right? I'm not, my kids are not alone. My, you know, what my son Saunders, 13 years old, if, you know, he, he's a genius piano player. You know how he does it? He goes to YouTube and he has a favorite song that he wants to play. And there's literally some sort of guitar hero version of piano that, that's on YouTube. And he and it's just magical little signs coming down that show which keys to hit. And he just memor he just literally follows the script and just memorizes it. Sure. So ki kids are finding the cheat codes right and left. Kid, you, could, you, could, you could go to Minecraft right now and look on YouTube and whatever you want to do, you can be, build some sort of Minecraft thing. So... So, but for some reason, adults, we have some sort of ego that says, no, 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 I'm going to do it the hard way. I'm going to figure it out on my own. Right. Use the cheat codes. I love that. Use the cheat codes. <laughs> Why not? I mean, what, I mean left, right, you know, right, right, BA select start. I, I still remember the it, it, That's a Nintendo. I remember that one. But I mean, look, I mean, that money, look, here's the thing. I want everyone to hear this. If you hear nothing else, that money spends just the same. Yeah. You know, the, the money, the money, that, the money that you earn from observing someone else and mimicking what they did and then, but doing it sooner than they learned it. It might've taken them 30 years to figure that little technique out. You can, you can, you can watch them over a couple of hours, mimic what they did, master it. And, and, and now it's, now you've got it down in, in, a, in a week. What well, took them 30 years. It's funny. People that are successful too, tend to be perfectly willing to, uh, to share the, how, how they did it, what the tricks are. I, I've always been, you know, I've always been surprised at how open the world is. The knowledge is there, right? It's just, you gotta, you gotta find it. As an actionable takeaway, what, what would you say the field salespeople who are listening today should do uh, as a first step towards gaining the mindset of a sales warrior? Well, the first step that I would say, of course, is is by my book, The Mindset of a Sales Warrior. So, and I mean that sincerely, I will tell you, you know, look, here, here's, here's the best criticism I ever received about the Mindset of a Sales Warrior book on Amazon. And that was the person, the person gave me like one star and he said, he said, I was very excited about this book, something like that. You can look on there and see what he says. Very excited about this book. But if, if you've been someone that's read the hundreds of self-help authors out there, then you don't need to read this book. <laughs> and I was like, exactly. That's exactly okay. correct. I've read the, I've read the hundreds of self-help authors and I took like, you know, Carol Dweck's mindset books, like 400 pages long. Right. I took, I read that entire book and I created a, like a, like a six page summary of specifically how do you need to have a growth mindset as it relates to sales? You know, Tony Robbins, six human needs. You know, I've gone through probably 300 hours of Tony Robbins training and I took the six human needs concept and applied it in one little five page, five page strategy on how to apply the six human needs to your life and sales. So I've just, my point is I've just done the work for you. So I've just, I've, I've just edited it all out, summarized it. And then if you want to go deeper, then yeah, I tell you what book to read and you can go deeper on it. I love that. The one star review. That's actually a five star review. <laughs> just it's the best review I can get. I did exactly what I was supposed to. I was, that was what I was trying to do. I was like, thank you. That's what I was trying to do. I love it. Well, I'm going to try to summarize um, what we've talked about today. Uh, so first of all, we all have a warrior within us. There are three components of, of a sales warrior. There's the mindset, the process, and the language. 
the performance formula we talked about a ton is performance is equal to knowledge minus your leashes. So performance is what we're doing and knowledge is what we've been taught to do, what we've learned to do. And then leashes are what we've been taught to hold us back. There's external leashes and those are thoughts like, you know, this is outside of my control. There are fear leashes like, uh, you know, things that make you reluctant to do something because you're afraid to do them. And then there are rule leashes, which are super important. And that's um, where you, you say, uh, well, I could, I, I would need to see this or I need to feel this or I need to hear this before I can engage in this, in this element of sales. And those are all leashes and, and, and identifying them and removing them is so important to increasing your performance. Training should be about changing behavior, not just teaching uh, knowledge. And, and so removing the leashes salespeople have is a way to change their behavior. So to change your behavior, you can ask yourself, what stops me from doing this, you know, blank with 100% of my sales calls this week? And you can, you can take any piece of sales knowledge. I mean, go pick your favorite episode and go listen to it again. And, and then, then ask yourself, run through the frame or the, the lens, okay, well, why can't I do what, what Chris Voss just told me? What's, what's, what stops me from doing that on my sales calls? What this thing that Deb, Deb Calvert taught me about prospecting? What, what is the, what's holding me back from, from qualifying like this? And, and that, that may identify a leash. The warrior believes that their product or service, uh, they believe in their product or service, and they, they really want to protect their prospects by providing them with something better than what they have. With Jason's 543 selling process, salespeople, one of the most important parts of it, I think it was step six, salespeople can veto their prospect's perspective of how they see this space, this product or service. They can get them to reanalyze it. And, and that, that if, they're, if they reanalyze it, they're much more likely to be open to a change. The most successful sales warriors are actually very predictable. They like processes and, and ultimately great companies have predictable processes that lead to predictable successes. You know, this, is, this has all been so, so valuable here. Tell me, where, where can our listeners read more about your work? I mean, you mentioned your book. How do they re reach out to you? How, how could they engage with your consulting firm? Awesome. So just go to fpg.com. So F is in forest, P is in performance, G is in group.com. Uh, there's plenty of different um, ways to you know, connect with us and, and subscribe to newsletters we're doing and all kinds of free downloads. Uh, also uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Again, I don't, I don't have a problem with, I'm not going to like hold my connections hostage. So, you know, we, let's be connected on LinkedIn and, and uh, I'd love to be connected with you. And I'd love for you to send me a direct message saying that you've listened to this. Uh, and that you, you, in something, you know, something specifically that you got value out of. I love it. I mean, you've got 15,000 more, you might as well use them, right? <laughs> might as well use them. Might as well use them. And I will say, look, the nice thing about COVID, you know, cause I think a warrior always finds the advantage. And I'll tell you the greatest thing about COVID right now, guys, is that from a training learning perspective is that like in our case, we've got, we used to do everything. We used to do everything in person. And, and now um, even our in-person events are on zoom. And so every month we've got, you know, we've got warriors selling for B2B, warriors selling for B2C. We've got, I mean, these are, these are, these are our best in class, number two in the world sales training program that that's, that's, you can, you can take completely on Zoom right now with trained instructors, with follow-up videos, you know, the real deal. I love it. Well, hey, this, this has been a fantastic episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you work in field sales, you'll love the Badger Map. The number one route planner helps you sell 20% more while driving 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. If anyone out there can think of other sales reps who would, who would benefit from learning what we've learned today, definitely forward this episode on to them. Take care until next time, everybody.